Obama Biden presidential inaugural committee. Before his most recent roles, Scott spent more than a dozen years on Capitol Hill and played key roles in numerous landmark legislative battles. Scott is a native of Washington, D.C. and a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and Georgetown University Law Center. Our first guest speaker, Matt Gorman, is the Strategic Campaign Communications Director for the Biotechnology Innovation Organization. His job consists to advise Fortune 500 companies and members of the world's largest technology organization of communications and rapid response. A veteran of two presidential campaigns, Mr. Gorman is one of the government's most experienced research rapid response operatives. He served as Deputy Rapid Response Director for the May 2004 presidential campaign and recently served as Rapid Response Director and National Spokesman for former Florida Governor Jeff Bush 2016 campaign. A native of Toronto, Connecticut, Mr. Gorman graduated from Story Hill College and reside in Washington, D.C. Our second guest speaker is Elizabeth Devin Elizabeth Devin Shin currently serves as the head of communication at Milner, a healthcare technology startup that works with both public and private sector partners. She tried to understand and improve how people use healthcare. Prior to joining Luna, Ms. Jerry Chin worked as Director of Global Communication at Tulsa Motor and Senior Communication Advisor at Civic Atlantic. She served as Director of Research at the White House and Special Assistant to the President during the first two years of Obama administration, then worked as Director of Research for President Obama's re-election campaign. Ms. Jerry Chin previously worked as a research and communication strategist at CNBC and as vice president at EMS Inc. She studied at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, and attended the University of California, Berkeley, where she graduated Phi Beta Kappa and Valedictorian in political science. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Scott Morehouser, Matt Goldman, and Jerry Chin. There's nothing better than Very excited to have you know, the best with us today. So it's, I mean, there's nothing yeah, better. No, it's, yeah. And when you can see it, and you know it's happening, with the eye of someone, which you guys are going to learn about today, it's even better. Because you know it's not organic, you know it's really good. Really <laughs> and you're silently either give your friends or your vicious enemies complete and total credit. Yes, that's yeah. very true. Yeah. 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 Um, so with that, uh, this is about you guys, and, and we're going to turn to a discussion with the students. <coughs> Why don't you just take just a minute to talk about you guys, your background, how you ended up, where you are, and, and sort of your professional career, the ways you choose. Uh, so, um, as, a, as discussed a little bit, um, so I grew up in California, I'm a California native, um, and in a family that is all about public service and military service. And so my dad was a Marine, my grandfather was a career naval officer, my mom was a public defender, so we were the family that watched the news and then sat down and had dinner and talked about what we watched. And so all I ever wanted to do was work in politics. Like my parents tell this hugely embarrassing story for me as a Democrat, at one point they were yelling at the television during the 1984, one of the 1984 presidential debates and like little four year old Liz jumps up in front of the television like, don't yell at the president! <laughs> and I've never heard that down, like defending Ronald Reagan. My mother's like, so, see? Um, this is called Story of the Savages from the yes. and using it later. Yeah, no. <clears throat> yeah. Scott's taking notes because he needs to pay me back for all the hits I've landed against him over the course of our friendship. It's fine. <laughs> um, but all I ever wanted to do was work in politics. And, but what was really interesting about finally sort of discovering research was that it existed. Um, I 
at Berkeley, like I loved doing research. I wrote a thesis. Um, I was always interested in current events, but I never, to be honest, like up until I moved to DC and kind of fell into research, I didn't know it existed. I, I knew that I didn't like knocking doors. Um, I knew that I didn't like fundraising, but I really wasn't sure where my skill sets and interests were applicable. And in a very DC story, um, a friend of a friend knew a guy who was starting up his research firm again and put me in touch and I had coffee with this guy and he sort of explained to me what political research was. I was like, oh, I totally want to do that. Like, I get to spend my days going through primary source and, you know, research opportunities and secondary source stuff and like pulling together this narrative and digging into it and then like going and punching somebody in the mouth. Like, this is awesome. Um, I will totally do this. And so I worked there at that research firm for two cycles. Um, which was a bit non-traditional. I think a lot of people, like you probably started out like on the campaign trail and I did it slightly reverse order of operations and was on the consulting side first. Um, but it, I think it actually worked out really nicely for me because we had a very broad client list. And so I ended up learning how to do uh, research against legislators, which is a very different set of sort of scope of a project against doing research on an executive and then doing research on, we did research on ballot initiatives and you know, fact check polls and ads and all sorts of things like that. Um, and, but I just, I loved it. It was, it was incredibly fun. Um, there is, Scott is right, there is nothing better than a good research hit. It is, um, it is phenomenal. It just, it feels so good. <laughs> it's so good. Um, it, there's also nothing worse than knowing that a hit is coming towards you and not knowing, like, and almost not being able to stop it. Um, to be on the, res it's one thing to be on the, on the offense when it comes to research and like putting the hit out there. It is another thing to be on the receiving end when the reporter to whom your opponent has fed the research calls you up and is like, so, I have some documents. And you're just like, oh. Um, it's, it's a horrible feeling. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it is, you get the equal highs and lows. Um, but yeah, so I was, at, I was at a research firm for two cycles, which was incredible. I then um, went up to New York and actually did um, research and sort of messaging and programming at CNBC for a year. Um, so for those of you who are interested in also like its applicability uh, outside the political world, there, there are all sorts of ways in which, I think of it as, as sort of risk management and reputation protection um, can, can be brought into play. And then I uh, got a phone call while I was living in New York um, from some friends in uh, Obama land in Chicago, and they're making the turn towards the general election. And when that happens, you expand your staff because you need sort of fresh ground troops to come in, all these poor bastards who've been there <laughs> since the early days are, are exhausted at that point. Um, so, yeah, and actually it, it was, you know, in, in fairly typical Obama fashion of 08, um, there, were, there were huge swaths of us who worked at headquarters who actually didn't get paid. So I worked for free. Um, the guy was like, I have a job for you, I have a card table, and I have a desk and a computer. I, what I don't have for you is a paycheck. Can you be here in two weeks? And I was like, yep. And I broke my lease in New York, and I threw my stuff in storage, and I got a long way ticket to Chicago, and like, that was it. Um, and was deputy director of content on the first campaign, was White House research director for the first two years, and then worked with Scott um, on the reelect. And um, it, you know, it, it was just like, it's also been fascinating, but I'm sure you've seen just like the ways in which research has changed. Um, I mean, I, so I started out doing it in the 04 cycle, so 2003, um, you know, <laughs> 2003, there's no Twitter, there's no Wi-Fi. Um, yeah, like there, everything that we use nowadays, particularly in like the deployment of research, is so different. But even a lot of the tools, uh, I think particularly when it comes to video, are, are incredibly different. Um, and it's been really fun to watch that evolve. And, and it is, um, yeah, it, it's a great subfield. I just can't say enough about it. It's great. Don't let anybody tell you that we're the trolls under the bridge. Yeah, Jim Buck has called us that in an article about Jason Minor. So, I know. I know. I know. I know. As we talk about Liz made one interesting point in passing that's worth sticking with, which is we all talk about oppo and opposition yeah. research, mm -hmm. but there's the other half of the equation, which is self research. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. If yeah. your guy plagiarizes Kyle's thesis and you know it, you have a book and a game plan so that if someone ever finds that out. When they find it. Yeah, it's a matter of time. Yeah, it's, it's always if, it's never. Or I think right, it's always when it's not if. And it's and a friend we have friends who do this and who consult for candidates mm -hmm. and they go to candidates and say, say why do I need you? And they say, 
because I know these three things about you that you don't want someone else to find. Yeah. And it's the best interview in the world. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's the most valuable of the research is yes. self cost yeah. Um Yeah, no, so uh, I just, I, my story starts because I really needed a Halloween costume. It's 2000, uh, I was 11 years old, I was kind of over Halloween, I didn't know what to be. So somebody suggested, well, why don't you be either Al Gore or George E. Bush? So I go, uh, I was like, well, I'll be George E. Bush, he seems like a fun guy. And so I go to my local GOP headquarters to get a pin um, so I can go around my suit and my mask and be George E. Bush. Turns out one of my good friend's grandmothers was head of the town committee. She's like, Matt, why don't you come in, election day, hang out, you know, help us out. So I drank Pepsi and had all the old ladies brought cakes, and I loved it. And that's kind of how I got started in politics. Um, and, you know, fast forward, uh, I knew that I wanted to do this as a, for a living. Uh, I'm from the Northeast, born in Connecticut, went to school just out in Boston. So it's my senior year, spring semester, I'm trying to figure out, you know, an internship. Um, I thought about, you know, as every good Republican does up in New England, you know, Scott Brown is the only game in town for Republican New England, um, or, you know, do, do something else. So I got through connection, a friend of a friend, uh, got an interview uh, with Mitt Romney's PAC. He, it was, this, by this time it's January 2011, he's getting ready to run for president. So um, I got the internship, I did anything possible, I got sandwiches, I drove people to from the airport, worked the auto pen like, uh, you know, no other, and then I graduate, he announces within two weeks, and they have a spot for me um, on the campaign as an intern, unpaid, doing research, you know? And um, so well, I, I- Unpaid, always unpaid. Of course, oh. and so I, I was like, this is the you know, opportunity of a lifetime. I'm you know, 22 years old, I can't pass this up. So I used my savings, subletted a mouse-infested apartment outside of Boston. I couldn't keep food there because there were holes in it uh, by the time he got woke up in the morning. And, uh, as what I did for a couple months, finally got a job doing opposition research in the GOP primary for Rick Perry, Newt Gingrich, and Rick Santorum. It was like, you know, it was an opposition research was a dream. So and so oh, yeah. we did that so through the primary. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then uh, when the general hit, as Liz kind of alluded to, uh, stats expand in a major way. And it becomes from, I kind of compare it, it's a little bit like a, everybody doing a little bit of this, a little bit of mm -hmm. that, too. It's, a, it's kind of an assembly line. You yeah. do your thing. You pass it on, and it's a mass operation. Uh, and so I then transitioned into what's called rapid response, which was uh, and more taking information from research, and get, dealing with reporters, doing writing, coordinating other ad piece, making sure that the research was solid, the ad we put out. And I, that's what I did from April to November. From there, I went to the NRCC, so we ran all the House race Republicans from 2013 to 2014, and I was the first one to kind of have that job. So I, I kind of tried to bring those skills, rap response, research skills, both nationally when we were dealing with Obamacare website, and, you know, Pelosi and that type of thing, but also the granular level. How can we give these candidates who have maybe five person staffs yeah. the ability to, you know, have some type of rap response operation and research operation. And then December, January of 2014, uh, I get a call from uh, Jeb Bush's people and uh, I started, I moved down to Tallahassee, Florida and then they had me move a few months later to Miami, Florida, and there's a big difference between the two of those, let me tell you. Um, <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, and uh, I was very happy to be out of uh, Tallahassee. And I was, uh, I ended up running rap response operation and, and being a, a spokesman for Jeb's campaign. Did that for a year, uh, and I worked with Michael Steele, who was I think, one of your other fellows, uh, with debate prep and, and, and part of the strategy team there. Um, and now I'm taking a little bit of complaints right now. It's, it was fantastic. It's a little burnt out, but uh, that's kind of my story. It's kind of accidental, but uh, and a lot of luck. I think a lot of people in politics where they end up is accidental. Yeah, yeah. completely. Yeah. Right place, right time. One hundred percent. Yeah. I think we would probably all agree. Rule one, from a student perspective, rule one is just get there. Yeah. So you find a candidate you like. Yeah. And you know a way to get in to start as an unpaid something, and it will work out most of the time. So if you want to work in Washington, get to Washington. Getting there is happening. So um, with that, we may be joined in a minute by my wife, who had rapid response for the Senate Democrats and also worked with Liz in, uh, in for the NCAA for a while. But Liz and Matt, why don't you guys talk a little bit about you would about sort of how research happens. We in politics know about the book and what you have in your own yeah. so How does, how do you, when you are helping a candidate or helping a campaign, what does it mean to do research for them and how do you sort of, how do you store, how do you 
get hits ready? How do you get ready to respond to them? Talk about the, the machinations and how research and that response yeah. actually works. Well, I think, so I think what's interesting is, is you talked about the NRCC. Yeah. Um, so the, the consulting firm where I was, uh, our biggest client was Adetra. Yeah. Um, and doing research for those kinds of guys is very different from doing research at a presidential level. Um, to his point, right, like most of the congressional campaigns, yeah, if you're lucky you have a staff of six or seven, yeah. you do not have a research director no. on a house race, um, unless you are like ridiculous bananas fundraiser, yeah. or maybe if you're Nancy Pelosi or a couple of these guys, like who really, yeah. you know, if you're Paul Ryan, like you're John Boehner, maybe you have research. But for the most part, they rely on the committees yeah. to supply them with information about their opponents. And so that kind of book, the, the committee, so either the, the House Committee or the, the House Democratic Committee or the House uh, Republican Committee, Campaign Committee, will have big research shots for the most part that will like crank out these books. Yeah. Those are very different. Um, those are oftentimes uh, votes and quotes yeah. books where you, you pull down, you know, particularly as an incumbent legislator, what you're doing is pulling down votes, sponsorships, co-sponsorships, and doing a LexisNexis dump of the things they've said. Because the truth of the matter is, is you have to crank these things out probably somewhere on a timetable between three to six weeks. Yeah. Um, and the truth is, is that does the job for yes. most campaigns. Um, a presidential campaign is a very different beast. Yeah. And, and, and you, so the book isn't good enough, right? right. So it's a two year campaign, so you came in live, 300 pages, right. so that's the last. Yeah. The, the book is where you start, and, and that is, I think, the template for a lot of your long-term conditions as a reporter. So, you know, you know ahead of time, you, you want to lay some groundwork on certain areas. And, and as Liz was saying too, with presidential candidates, there's a much richer history there. There's, I'm sure that there might be business dealings, there might be, you know, if they're a governor of a big state, there's different areas of the state that, that they've had, you know, education, healthcare, et cetera. But then what you're doing is, and it, this might fall slightly more into the rap response for the quick research hits, is interviews with you know, appearance that they've done. You're, you're going through videos, and, and it's much more of a living document, yeah. and you're dealing with things day to day. They're not even doing an interview with a local reporter, or you know, have a radio interview. You're listening for opportunities, and if they're ready to clip it, you're getting to report it right away. It's much more of a living thing. Yeah, I think that's right, and I think though that um, when it comes to putting together a research operation for a presidential, um, the challenge is is you have to you have to have you have to build an operation and scale it so that it can walk and shoot gun at the same time. So that you can be doing deep dive investigative research for both self-research and on your opponents, and also feeding the daily beast yes. before the beast eats you. Um, because it has big teeth and is very hungry. Um, but like I like to think of it as like what you do, if you're designing the scope of the research, again, either self-research or oppo, and you make the great point that self-research is like is so much more important than oppo. Yeah. If you do not know your strengths and weaknesses, like you are, you are a boxer, you know, with a blindfold on, like standing in the middle of the ring, just waiting for a haymaker. Like you have no idea. You might as well just like it's ridiculous, and you can see it happen. Like you can tell when the hits come and a they candidate is not prepared for it. They are just like they. You, the news cycle kills you, and they are flat-footed. It's like some response. It's just horrendous. It is the worst feeling in the world. But to to sort of draw the scope of it, like what you want to do is figure out the parameters of your. Um, I, just because I'm a linear thinker, I do it as a timeline. Um, and I break apart the chunks of their life, usually like birth to college, or like birth through high school, college, post-college, and then however that sort of breaks out professionally. Um, and then you have a sort of a pre-birth like family component. But once you have the timeline, then it's figuring out what are all the offshoots off of that. Who, like, Literally, where were they? Who were with whom were they in those places? What did they do? And you begin scoping out, and each of those things are these incredibly <coughs> big research projects because it's it's not just it. Even if you're doing a research book on a House candidate, those guys sometimes will have very extensive backgrounds <coughs> that that would warrant deeper dives. But what you don't have is the media scrutiny that you have on a presidential. And you don't have opponents with the resources that they have on a presidential, and so you—it is incumbent upon you to know this stuff before the other guy does. Um, and in a presidential, if you have the resources, it's you. St I, I tend to start with a sketch again, a sketch and sort of a timeline, and start with secondary resources, um, clip dumps, and what you can pull down off of LexisNexis and what's publicly available. 
But then, like, you have to go so much deeper than that. You need to talk to the friends. You need to talk to the relatives. You need to get the college transcripts. You need to, like, you are sending people to those places. Like I said, they grew up at X place and maybe moved around. Like, you are sending teams there to pull high school yearbooks, old, you know, going to the local newspaper and all the local TV affiliates and the radio affiliates and getting, like, anything. Was this person, like, were they homecoming king? Were they, you know, active on the student body? And, like, did they write a bunch for their high school newspaper? You have to have that stuff. Because your opponent is sending people to get that stuff too. Absolutely, and I think you know really quick is so you know you had you had experience with with Obama and especially in twelve you guys you guys knew that you were going to be writing this in a couple of years. Yes. And so what the problem is I have a tendency to run these primaries where people <coughs> keep popping up yeah. and go for it, you know. And so I'll never forget it, you know. As I said before, we had Rick Perry, Newt Gingrich, and Rick Santorum in 2012. John Huntsman. John Huntsman. Yeah, well, you know, you think, you thought Huckabee was going to run. Yeah. But I'll never forget it. It was December 10th ish, December 12th, and my boss uh, pulls me out. He just got out of the meeting. They'd just broken up. And he goes, I got to see you right now. And he just goes in the hallway. He goes, We need a book on Rick Santorum, and we need him in two weeks. And and that and that is, again, what you just said, we need to do that. For, for, over the holidays, yeah. in two weeks, and you need to pull it together because don't forget it was twenty, a third, thirteenth, or I guess twenty ten or whatever, twenty eleven. The voting starts in three weeks, and, you know, and he is yeah. surging because he hasn't had no scrutiny yet. So no one has been able, has done that apple yet. So we need to do it and do it yeah. as best we can. We can't get all we can't cover the box no. in two weeks, but we need to try and the best we can and triage this and hold on for three, four weeks. Yes. Yeah. 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 And you know. Liz and Karen Rose will talk about going to courthouses oh, yeah. to find oh. you know, John McCain's property. Worst food poisoning of my life oh. I got in Jefferson City, Missouri, because I was writing a book on Sam Graves, okay. Missouri 6? Something like that. Missouri 5, Missouri 6. And I had to go to the uh, the state archives in Jeff City, which at the time had like a Walmart, and that was it, um, and a Red Roof Inn. Do not have breakfast buffet. <laughs> Red Roof Inn at, in Jeff City. But like sat there going through state legislative records um, and like transcripts from the hearings that Sam Graves had chaired as like a, you know on some committee when he was a state legislator in Missouri. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know we sent people to New Hampshire to get the like the records for Governor Romney's house in Lake Winnipesaukee and same thing in, in La Jolla. Like you 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 are boots on the ground in these places doing the primary. Absolutely, I think that I think people tend to think, and I, I don't think you guys are that bad, but I think mean, the general public tends to think that research is done with taking two cabs to a foggy bottom yeah. a parking lot yeah, right. with a guy in a trench coat yeah. gives you photos. Like, it's nothing like that. Yeah. It's very tedious, it can be very yeah. boring. We really wish it was like that. Absolutely, it would be so much more fun. It's like a great movie. Yeah. You're like, I sat in this library for eight hours until it closed. Yeah. Sweet. And then they kick yeah. you out. <laughs> and you get to the library. Yeah. And, and, and the way it kind of goes is like 90% of the stuff you find is. Nothing oh, or unusable. Five percent yeah. is worth going in the book. Three percent of that you think is good. Two percent you pitch for quarters. One percent like it gets, it gets written the way you want it to. Yeah, and that is your point. You just want to know. You just want yeah. to have yeah. it. So yeah. you know. Because you never know where that document is. Right. And also, I'll say this too: is things look very differently. You know, let's you know, let's say you have a certain piece of op- oppo, and it's just incredibly innocuous. But as we said, with presidential or even you know. With, uh, for example, with, you know, like a tie Aiken, when something comes up that changes the race, yeah. you know, when, when you had the votes uh, for people across the country and where they stood on, on, the, on the forceful rape yeah. stuff, that, you know, things look very different as current events warrant yes. that. So you need to be armed with it because um, research that you might, that might seem innocuous can, so you know, very, per- very, very pertinent and, yeah. you, and, you know, you just kind of combine it. Yeah, and, and you also, like, you do stuff just as a matter of course and occasionally something like, so we had people go to La Jolla. So part of what you do, both for self and oppo, is that you get all the documents about, um, publicly available documents about somebody's residence. So like, or, you know, so just property records and things like that, Has there, have there been tax liens on their house, like anything like that. So again, you know, the governor had the family this house, Robert governor Robert Robert had, Robert. had the house in Lake Winnipesaukee, there was a condo in Belmont, in Massachusetts, uh, there have been, I guess they, they they bought the place in Park City. Yeah, they, they had. Uh, yeah, they I can't. Something. Yeah, I can't remember. Yeah. Um, but then there was this house that he had purchased in La Jolla, which is a part of San Diego. Um, and so again, like 
you either send your own people out or you hire people who, who work at firms who will go do it. And so we had folks do the, the document collection, which is, again, like totally standard. You almost never, like this is the only time, honestly, that this has ever come up with anything. And I did research for like 15 years. But we get the documents that come back from, from the team out in California. And, you know, it's a house right on the beach. And so you've got documents from the city of La Jolla, the California Coastal Commission, the county of San Diego, like all of these, the yeah. state, like all of these. And again, not much. We're like, well, it's a really nice house. I wish that was my house. Sweet view. <laughs> like, <I didn't> <laughs> but we open up the, but they had petitioned the city, well, the city and the county, so a couple of different bodies to do a renovation of the house. And as part of that, you have to submit blueprints. And it, so what was fascinating is the people who did the document collection for us totally missed it. Really? Totally missed it. <laughs> and one of my deputies, I did this, G-chat, like, uh, hey boss, can you come out here for a second? And I was like, okay. And he spreads these things out, and he's like, what is that? And it's like, two car lift. And I was like, that is a car elevator. <laughs> and nothing says regular guy for context. Nothing says <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like having a car elevator or two. Yeah, and so it was just like Christmas come early. It was like, holy bananas, this is great stuff. And so <laughs> like, then it becomes the interesting part. Yeah. Of, this is where research is not just about the find, yeah. but then how do you roll it out? How do you roll it out? And that's, that's, that's just as crucial as that one. Yeah, yeah. 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 so I was about to ask, yeah. so, and Kara's now with us in the back as well. What, what makes a good hit? And mm -hmm. talk about how mm -hmm. you got it, because we, we all want a good hit. What makes a good hit, and how do you decide how and when to so I think you, you touched on it, and I'll, I'll let you answer the, the part about like, how you think that best deployed, but I think it's, so you said like, nothing says regular guy like having a car elevator. The best hits, in my opinion, are the things that reinforce, so on the oppo side, the best hits are the things that reinforce existing negative perceptions about your opponent and help to solidify those reasons that people don't want to vote for that person. Yeah. And when you have a guy who is you know, an incredibly accomplished businessman who has been governor of the state and done it well, like the Mitt Romney's biggest problem was his inability to connect with voters and to, when asked by, you know, pollsters or focus groups people, like, is he fighting for people like you? And does he understand your problems? The answer was usually no. So if you had a hit that reinforced that, that was, that was gold. Uh, that, that, yeah, you're absolutely right. And I think, like, so, uh, so just to kind of go back to the round, round, rounding comparison is uh, primary 2012, we lose South Carolina pretty badly. And at the South Carolina primary, we were focused totally on Florida. We were, you know, the polls initially, both internally and externally, did not look good in Florida. But we knew we had a week or 10 days to turn around. And if you remember, Newt had a couple great debates in South Carolina, and we knew this next debate in Florida would be really big for us. And Newt was hitting Mitt on uh, his investments with Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, and Goldman Sachs, and he would, that was kind of his talkers, and uh, it, it kind, of, yeah. kind of goes back to the point, it was hammering with the notion you just said. So we knew this was coming in the debate, and we knew he was gonna say it. So um, one of our researchers, Ted, was going to um, news uh, tech returns, he found something interesting. And so we had it for a couple days, and we chose to unveil it in the most kind of dramatic way possible. So during the debate, Newt does his normal line about, you know, Governor Romney has, has investments in Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac, and Goldman Sachs. And Governor Romney, how do you respond? And, go, and Governor Romney goes, well, have you checked your own returns? And the crowd goes nuts. And he goes, well, you also have the same investments. And he found that in Newt's tax returns, the exact same ones. And the key was, I think, we could have probably deployed that hit, you know, to a reporter three, four days ahead of time. And but then that gives a chance for Newt to, to explain it. Yeah. It's probably not a question in the debate, or he's already had, he practiced the answer. And so we had, by keeping a secret and leaving the principal lead with it uh, during the debate, it got much more play. And then all the reporters watching the debate will come and ask, wait, do you have, do you have the research? Yeah, yeah. And so with every story, it's in every write-up, and there's also probably side stories about Newt's tax returns and from us explaining it. And the key, a, a, a great comparison is the last debate with Alicia Machado and Hillary. Oh, so good. That's, so if they, good. If, so good. If, if she does that, they release that story any time between, you know, before the debate to January. That's a Daily Beast story, up and post story, and it's one more person well, that is actually, offended. So it actually was. Yeah. yeah. was the thing, is that the right. story had yeah. been out there. Yeah. But all of a sudden you had Hillary on stage with far more people far actually more. tuning in. 
right, and tuning in for the first yep. time. So you, it, it is in some sense an opportunity to say it for the first say time. Say it for the first time. I, did, I never heard it. I followed pretty closely. I, heard, and, I, I followed closely. I didn't yeah. realize the, the, the discrimination case from 73. Yeah. I was like, what? And so and, and it, they, there's a textbook example. Yeah. She brought it up. So, so all the reporters went to her team, said, where are the details? Yeah. So they probably read the story. And then they have the web video of the conference call ready to go. And, and we're now, you, I, heard, I said the name, everybody knew exactly what I was talking about. Yeah. So we're in day 10 of the story. It was what, day 9? Yeah. And all because they rolled it out in a way that was most beneficial to the campaign. Yeah. Can you guys, and care for free challenge if you like, can you guys talk about, and I want to, then we'll turn to these guys for questions before we talk about this year, but more about 16. But maybe your favorite hit or two, I mean, Matt, in particular, I've got some video, which was, yeah. you know, a moment where you either changed a race or you brought up one example earlier, but you know, yeah. something that really resonated, you were particularly proud of, or you were ready for it and planned to be planned to. Mm -hmm. You know, a moment or two that you feel like you can look back and, and say, this is one of my favorite hits. I mean, Matt, you had opponent after opponent and, and, yeah. and you know, coming at you for a while. Like, yeah. I wonder if you, if you want to kick that off. Um, yeah. There, there, yeah, there's one uh, that kind of stands out. Uh, it's, uh, it's new and it, it's probably the best research release. And I, I, I can't take credit for all of it. Uh, we, the, the team did, uh, did most of it. I just it did one or two little things. But um, new likes to make a lot of radio statements. God love them. Great, you know. And so we we just started like when you're reading these like last message next stuff, you realize that new likes to compare himself to great people in history. And and Pericles, a Viking, Vince Lombardi. Uh, the founding fathers, like, in, 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 and the in, best thing is that this yeah. is on video. Like, it's, it's one thing yeah. he's giving an interview. This other thing is on TV. He's probably going to himself. Yeah, and and, and, oh, and, 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 and so he, there's one quote that's like, "I first thought about saving civilization in summer 1990." <laughs> and so we compiled all of these, and, and we did it. And like, there there are a ton of these. If you, if you Google grandiose new, it's a Time Magazine thing. They just print the entire yeah. thing verbatim, um, and they did a morning Joe thing on it. And so. Uh, we just did it, and it was in one of the debates, uh, Rick said, Rick Santorum goes, you know, you get a lot of grandiose ideas, and of course, you defends it, and so that was the moment we've been holding on this for a long time, talks about distribution of it, and we sent it immediately, and there was like, something made a thing, Twitter, like, it just took over Twitter at that point, and, um, and it, it had no, like, it wasn't a real substantive hit, but it just mocked, yeah. it totally mocked, and, 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 and uh, those are the types of things that, like, that can kind of cut through the clutter, um, and become a little, have a little tinge of pop culture that kind of have the most resonance, I find. Yeah. Um, oh, God, what is my favorite research hit? There's so many good ones. Um, oh, two quickly. Number one, so, and Carol will remember this, because she was, she was in Chicago <coughs> in 2008. Um, she was a DNC researcher. So I ran the Palin research in 2008, which people laugh about now, because you're like, oh, ha, ha, what research? Like, okay, what people don't remember was that first two weeks of Sarah Palin, cool. she blew the cool. doors off the place, cool. right? Like, we saw, you know, in the big, remember, back in 2008, one of the concern in the general for Obama, the concern was with the white working class women, the Pumas, that they, that they were referring to, like, white working class women who had voted for Hillary, how many of those could we attract into the Obama coalition? There was this big, outstanding question of, like, could you do that? It, particularly in kind of like Rust Belt states and, and some of the swing states, a real challenge around that. And Sarah Palin comes out and we watch our numbers just like just like 20 point swing in, in white working class women over to John McCain because they weren't super fired up about John McCain either. So it was a real issue. And it was also one of those things where like I don't think in the history of presidential campaigns, in modern presidential campaigns, have you had like an eight week sprint to define somebody in the way that Sarah Palin was a total unknown totally quantity canvas. on on the, like the state of Alaska website crashed the morning that she was announced because nobody had ever heard of her. Um, everybody, like, our phones were ringing off the hook. Like, who has anything on Sarah Palin? So, I mean, I spent, like, nights. I, you remember being on the conference calls with Tony Knowles, who yeah. was the former like, governor? small side note antidote. Like, yeah. the morning they announced Palin, oh, um, we were, the DNC's research team was sitting in this awful conference room right after our convention. Yep. And everybody freaked out because we'd never even, I was the only person in the room who'd heard of her yeah. because she was in a Vogue article like six <laughs> months before and I was like, oh, I know who this girl. And I can call the Alaska Democratic Party where my friend was the comms director and get her to get the research director off the plane to Montana 
because we didn't know anything about Sarah Pill. Yeah. <laughs> she put she up a whiteboard and like wrote out her life. Yeah, like, she had a tier three thing. potential like on her list of, of picks because she had, was under an ethical investigation. Like, what campaign puts somebody under an ethical investigation as the number two on the ticket? So it was just this mad sprint of who was going to get to define Sarah Palin first, right? And she's you know giving these killer speeches and these huge crowds and everybody's fired up. And she, cool. what she yeah. has not done yet are a series of tough interviews. And so it, so Charlie Gibson and Katie Couric get her as the first two. And I had some friends from my time at, at CNBC who knew Katie really well, and a bunch of people on the campaign did. And so they came to us, and they were, because again, nobody, no news organization, like nobody knew anything about Sarah Palin. Everybody was like, we're all in this boat together. Like, who's going to find the information? Yeah. And she came across initially as charming and thoughtful yeah. and lovely and oh, admirable. Yeah. Oh, and so like, yeah. 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 And so the, you know, the big thing for us that, that we needed, we had gotten out over our ski tips on was, was about her ability like, to be a heartbeat away from the president. And we had <coughs> totally mishandled it the first day. Um, but it was still, a, it was a totally legitimate issue. You just need to figure out a way to present, to sort of shine that spotlight on it. And so the, the, Kirk, folk, the Kirk producers were coming in and like, like, what do you guys have? Like, here's sort of what we have, like, what do you guys have? Um, and among the things we said was like, look, the issue, it, it's not so much like the issue that you need to ask it, it's that Katie is an amazing interviewer and nobody can be ready to answer questions, like almost nobody is probably going to be ready to answer questions like a vice presidential candidate needs to be ready to answer after three weeks in the national spotlight. She is great on the first answer, and she is great on the first bullet under the answer, and she is nowhere after that. And so you just have to keep pushing her. And they were like, what's the issue? It's like, it doesn't matter. And that's how you get to the, which newspapers do you read? Question. Because they don't, she didn't have the follow-up. Um, and that, like, that changed the race for us. It, all of a, yeah, all of a sudden, you, you get that, and you get this little, like, I, I can see Russia from my house. <laughs> like, and, and, you know, and we laugh about those things now, and we look back on it at this point, and it's like, you know, and particularly sort of the way in which things unfolded with Governor Palin subsequently, it's hard, it can be hard to remember a time where it was a real concern for a Democratic candidate, but it really was. And so that was a big change for us. And then I do think that, um, so there was one, when I was research director at the White House, you don't do like oppo, because um, it's just not appropriate for the government. Um, but what you're doing is trying to like put forth the best things about the policies that you're trying to advance, and also you know making sure that the the things that in your what your critics are saying like are, that you take as much of the air out of them as possible. And Rick Scott is the governor of Florida, and he is out there on TV just hammering away at the Affordable Care Act. And it's like, this dude was CEO of H HCA? HCA. Like, Giant Hospital. Giant Hospital Association that had faced the largest ever penalty on Medicare fraud, I want to say it was. It was like a billion dollars. And he's out there getting a free pass on every interview on television, just like, Obamacare this, Obamacare that. And I was like, will somebody please just question this guy's credibility? And of all people who finally took the research, <coughs> it was Rick Sanchez. Really? Oh, yeah. Man. You guys may not remember. Yeah. Rick Sanchez was the guy who got tased on television. He got fired. And then he got fired eventually. But like, he was not, he, you know, he was, like, it was not like going on Tim Russell. No. Right? It was, like, it was <laughs> not that kind of, like, you gotta be ready. You just need one. Yeah. yeah. But he, he did it, and I remember watching that, and it was just like, ah, oh, thank you. It was, it was just that moment of like, okay, we might be able to get back a little bit on a front foot here, or at least to neutral. You guys will be talking about this, but that's how you drive. You, you, you take shots, you take shots, you build narratives, and you try to define people before others get to do something. Yeah. So, look, we have someone to talk. We talked a little bit about careers and how sort of jumping into a campaign or jumping into Washington is kind of the way to start. What questions do you have? We can talk about 2016, but what questions do you guys have about either personal, about how they get where they are, or, or political questions, justice, go ahead. Yeah, I'm kind of curious, in, in like a non-election year, what do you do as, as a researcher? Do you still work on like opposition research in anticipation for the next election, or what are those in-between years like? 
I mean, I, 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 up until now, I've, I've worked kind of in the campaign cycle. So, you, you know, it, let's say if you're at the NRCC or last year with Jeb, you know, it's a little different. You're, you're getting research right. You're doing a lot of the, the foot locking and tackling that you'll need to get the eight, you know, months to sprint afterwards. Um, and you're also, I think, doling out some of the hits that you want to kind of lay the groundwork. Yep. So if you find some good hits, um, you want to leave some breadcrumbs and, and, and get some articles written way beforehand that you can kind of always refer back to. Um, but I think a lot, I know if you're not looking at politics, there are a ton of opportunities for like private sector type research where companies, um, they think what research is very mysterious and very, you know. Yeah, they think you're digging through trash cans yeah, and so so they are very allured by this idea of it. So if uh, you know a lot of folks in research firms that will work for a lot of different companies and consult for them and do pretty basic stuff, stuff that's not you know that complicated, yeah. but these people think it is, and uh, they can make a pretty good living off of that. If, if you're not, if you don't want to work in politics, um, and now I guess people have started to you know whether it's trade organizations or you know different interest groups have wanted have started to want to do oppo. On their competitors or their kind of adversaries in the field. Yeah. That's a new. That's a new thing. That's never really happened. Yeah. Before. No, I think um, I am a huge proponent. So research takes time. Um, you, you don't see the fruits of the labor often, particularly on on the investigative stuff, whether self research or, or opposition research. It takes a lot of time, um, and you need to take advantage of that. Like time is your most important resource as a researcher, um, and, and because research is also Oftentimes, pretty cheap. Like, you know, we work it's a good value. value. It's, yeah. And the ROI right. is, is almost incalculable. Yeah. Um, but it takes time to do it. So, I mean, like, I left the White House in February of 11 and started, like, I, I didn't, like, I left on a Thursday or a Friday and I started my job essentially as research director for the real life on Monday. Um, and we, we, like, worked every day for another two years. Um, you need to use that time to your advantage, you know, and like we had the advantage of being an incumbent, yeah. um, but we also knew, so for us it was it was sort of awkward, like we had a bunch of essentially self-research for the first two years of the administration, but you can't take from the White House to the campaign, like you can't, you just, you can't just pick up government resources and take them to a political campaign. So in some sense we had to almost start from scratch and like redo all the self-research for the first two years of the administration but also use that time to, to really do as much as we could on who we thought the, the potential Republicans were. And um, yeah, and you also, it's also one of those things, particularly if you have the advantage of incumbency. Um, we learned this trick, the, the guy who did it best was, uh, was Gray Davis, actually, uh, out in California. So before Gray Davis was governor of California, um, and the recall of governor of California, uh, he had actually been Jerry Brown's like, chief political guy. And he, more than anybody, really understood the idea that like you want to pick your opponent. So when Gray Davis was running for re-election, he again, with the advantage of incumbency, they spent a lot of their time and focused their energies on figuring out how to just to, to pick the Republican they wanted to run against and then direct the race <coughs> the primary as best they could. Um, and for us, you know, it was there were there were opportunities in the Republican primary to sort of shape the race and drive the conversation in a way that was advantageous to us. I mean, truth be told, I don't think that we had wanted the Bain conversation to start as early as it did. We were surprised. I remember waking up, uh, uh, rolling out of bed, and I think it was like April or May, and I see a Bain. Well, yeah. uh, here we go. I mean, Newt Gingrich uh, ran the first Bain. Yeah, yeah, and that was, uh, yeah, yeah. And that, that was, uh, and how do you put the genie back in the bottle once it's out? Right, no, I mean, it was. The worst thing for you is by, you know, September, it, it, oh, well, it's been a dead issue. Or people, we kind of talk right. all we all exactly. about it. So that's where it comes to timing, too. Yeah. And, you know, you don't get to, you, you can choose your opponents, but uh, if, if the GOP primary brings stuff out with people that yep. you, won't, you want to save for a little bit, yeah. that's, a, that's not an easy thing. Yeah. Um, just to answer another piece of it, there is some downtime between cycles. Though. If you're not an incumbent and you are a, whether you do campaign uh, communications or research or Fuel or something else. There is some latent time between campaigns that can be tough if you it's, do not do yes. AOL. Um, yeah. The other thing is, uh, in terms of picking your opponent, it's become a real strategy. Yeah, and absolutely. Democrats in the Senate, in particular, have used it. Um, Kara worked for Henry Reid, who sort of in 2010 managed to get rid of a bunch of opponents that end up with the one he wanted, who wanted to 
chartered health care for chickens and <laughs> Sue Sue Loudon. Sharon Angle. Sharon Angle. She beats him out. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Remember she was yeah. not a witch? Yeah. Similarly to the yeah. Queen of Yeah, Loudon yeah. was with the chickens. Then. Right. Yeah. And yeah. the yeah. other Republican yeah. candidate, Delaware, was definitely not a witch, according to her. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which we were defending whether or not you're a witch. You're a witch. And then similarly, there was um, 12 with uh, 12 with uh, uh, Aiken, but yeah. then also in Indiana with uh, Murdoch. Do you want to explain mm -hmm. this? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so uh, in, in Missouri, brutal three-way primary. Claire, Claire McCaskill, in, uh, danger incumbent. Uh, and I believe there was two other people. One was a businessman, John Brunner. Mm -hmm. The other one was, I, I can't think of her name. She's a power right now. Um, it was a woman. Yeah, it was a woman. Anne, it was Anne something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, um, and so they, 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 they kind of beat each other up, and Aiken sneaks through. And but Aiken sneaks through because McCaskill had but, stood yeah. up. Did she stand up a pack or something? She, she and, like, and ran, yeah, she ran up the Democratic incumbent basically helped force through the most rapidly conservative Republican yes. to because, influence the race yeah. so that she could have the opponent she wanted yes. in the race yeah. for the Democrats. Yeah. Yeah. And, and no, and yeah, I mean, and for us, like, I don't think that, you know, on the 12 side, we, we did it as much, but like, Ryan was a, was a good <coughs> opponent for us. We weren't, yeah. I don't think we were unhappy. Explain why. Um, because, so for us, right, one of the biggest challenges was that the recovery had not been, like, people didn't feel the recovery, even though the numbers were there, but the economic recovery, people just didn't feel it. It wasn't palpable to a lot of people. Um, and so if you, in that environment where, you know, and you'd seen the Tea Party, had, you know, you'd seen that boom in, in 2010, and so it's at that point that you're really beginning to see the rise of this kind of Republican populism, right? Yeah. Um, somebody like, with, with a profile at least, of like a Mike Huckabee, presented a really potentially complicating opponent, like could you know, was, was appealing to evangelicals, but could also talk the talk on like economic populism and get people to respond to that. And so you're like, okay, well, running against a guy who's worth a quarter of a billion dollars and who we can paint, you know, as somebody who, you know, put people out of work and like tore companies apart, like that's that's playing on offense for us. Um, Gingrich wouldn't have been bad either. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are a couple yeah. of others. And Santoro. Santoro. Yeah. Yeah. You um, know, Perry had Jr. he had he been a better candidate, presented a potentially dangerous. Toss the primary. Yeah. Perry presented a real problem yeah. because they close your eyes and picture one one end you have a a, a quote unquote moderate from Massachusetts who. Some would argue um, imposed a health care plan very that similar other, yeah. to one that Obama did and, and is getting a lot of you know flack for, and has you know again like there's certain things that folks can try and pull out of the business record that that can be painted in a certain yeah. light. In the other you know corner, you have a kind of swaggering Texas governor, great job growth, great economic record, and and it has a profile. Shoots coyotes, and, and it has a profile of the last Republican president. You know, and, and it's a long governing record, and it's kind of and it can walk into a fairground in Iowa, and just people yeah, are captured. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's what we were. You know, there's a very real worry there, um, and I think you know there's a good oppo team, and, and you know obviously there's other factors too. But uh, the backs of it, uh, yeah, um, that was that was a fun one. But uh, but but also again, the very very would be a typical interview that just for backs of it, potentially hopped up on. Yeah, it was, it, was, he, he, it was a Friday night, um, and he, he was being honored at some dinner, and he would he, I, I don't know who we've hopped up on, you know, whatever, but it was just, he was just, like, very effing, very eccentrically, he was creating maple syrup, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Googling Rick Perry eccentric press conference speeches. Yeah, it's, 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 it's yeah. All right, so what, what else? We talked about, um, before we wrap up, any, what kind of questions you guys have? We're happy to talk more practically, happy to talk more theoretically. You know, we want to make this helpful to you guys. So what question do you have? Go ahead. Yeah, I was kind of wondering, like, where do you guys start your research, especially because you talked about working on some more smaller races with uh, the private firms you worked on. Like, where do you start your research when you have maybe a candidate that's more unknown, that's not like a presidential race, where you've got tons to look at for Mitt Romney or you know, uh, Rick Santorum? Where do you start with your research? I think it's, it was kind of said earlier, you get, like, if, it, if it's a small congressional race or, or, or anything kind of focused on the area, they probably have 
serve their entire career or live in a great deal in that one area. So you're going to like places like city halls, courthouses, you're gonna do a lot of field research with that. There's phone records that are available to the public, but hopefully your opponent probably doesn't have the resources or, or the thoughts you guys do. And then but you're also just doing, you know, at LexisNexis, if you have those capabilities, you're doing that. And you're, you're going to the library, you're pulling, you know, the microfilm and the old newspapers, and you're, and you're just doing very basic blocking and tackling that. Even if they're, you know, not the most known person, if they have a record, if they're a state representative, if they're on a city council, there's, there's records in certain places. And if they went to a college and played, maybe you're going there. But I think you're, you're trying to kind of live, go where they live and you kind of try and build the consensual circles out from that. If, if, if they're not a statewide type of uh, candidate. Yeah. Um, on picking your opponent, uh, to what extent do you think the RNC tried to do that with the Democratic primary this year? Because, I mean, I was a Hillary supporter the whole time, but to me, it was like, well, Bernie's a self-proclaimed democratic socialist and has all this uh, uh, other baggage coming along with him, like socialized medicine. Uh, how can he not be getting hit for this all the time? Meanwhile, did the Republicans just not do that because they wanted to run against him, not Hillary? Yeah. That's <laughs> better. I, you know, I mean, I, I obviously Hillary, Hillary has her flaws, and, and we, you know, we talk about them too, but, like, Bernie was a 70-something-year-old socialist who, you know, wanted to make you know, America more like Sweden or whatever it was. Like, it, you know, I, I, that was a, you know, a very stark contrast. And I think, I mean, I know that some folks at the RNC were actively kind of tweeting about Bernie and trying to get him and make a little mischief there. I mean, that was, that was, a, no, that was no secret, you know? Um, yeah. Are you guys willing to take an individual question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, so before we wrap, can you give these guys, because this is ultimately, both a you know, discussion about you guys and a, and a career chat. So if you have one piece of advice for these guys, I'm going to end it for sure. If they're interested or intrigued or just kind of wondering about a career research, whether it's an internship, whether it's, what would you counsel these guys to do as your final sort of moment? I mean, is it just jump in and hit a campaign or head to Washington or jump into your favorite federal agency or political entity and start there? Or what do you guys have counsel for what, if you are somewhere between a college freshman and a grad student, I mean, I would say, yeah, get, get in it. Um, growing up, my like whole life, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Um, and both my parents are attorneys um, in public service, and we're both like, before you go to law school, go work with lawyers to see if this is actually what you want to do day to day. And I did it, and I was like, oh my god, this is not what I want to do at all. So awesome, saved myself like a buck 80. Um, and three years of my life and a career that I would have walked out of law school with a huge amount of debt and been probably not very happy. So, yeah, uh, but a year did that. Uh, but like, it was, I, so that was incredibly valuable for me to learn what I didn't want to do. And I, you're only gonna learn whether or not this is something you want to do or you don't want to do by going and doing it. Like, you need to get as close to it as possible. And I think, if, particularly if you're here in DC, there are opportunities at the committees, um, there are opportunities, you know, that now exist at places like Media Matters and um, America Rising, America Rising and, you know, that, that like that didn't exist when I started doing research. That, that are there now that can give you a flavor for it. Um, like, go do that. Take advantage of it. Get your like actually go do it and give it a try. Um, and know that the stuff that you're going to be doing as an intern is the stuff that you're going to be doing. Like as a research director on a presidential, <coughs> you'd, you'd, still, you'd be doing other things too. But like, I still used to sit down and crank through like LexisNexis search strings yeah. and like a bunch of clips and like we have races to see oh, who could get it first. Like, the stuff that you would do as an intern would be very like it would. It's the building block on which everything else you would do will be. The committees that Liz is referencing are the Democratic National Committee, the Republican National Committee, and then the Senate and Congressional Arm. So they each had um, entities that a couple of us have worked at. Help elect or Democratic senators or Republican senators or Democratic House members and Republican House members. So that's when she says the committees, that's what she's referencing. Um, and there used to be a Lexus string where you could sort of type, you know, Matt plus Gorman. Oh, plus Gorman. Matt, Matt and Gorman and, 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 and to Gorman with it and oh, Gorman, Gorman the, within the Boolean within, search is Oh, so good. They basically yeah. strategy okay. within one. Within one. Like, and it did and used to be in one. But like, there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's the long ones. But okay. uh, really quick, so there's no substitute for experience. Like, I think, he's, yeah. as you yeah. said, like, you can learn this stuff in theory, and, and you know, classes are great. Take a lot of them, but like, if you're, you know, if you have an impractical experience, you're going to be doing the same thing when you're 27 at a 
that Kate will be doing. So get involved as many as you can. And I think also um, do a couple things well. Learn to do a couple things well. There's one common string about campaigns, whether you're running a presidential or a city council race, that they all want to save money. So if you can do, uh, if you can do a job and a half or two jobs, so I learned, I knew I had to do research and then I transitioned into doing it, talking to press and being a spokesman. Um, that's two jobs. So if, if you are working at a statewide, you can talk, you can hire me for the, the cost of two uh, people. And so even if it's something as simple as like Photoshop and being fluent in foreign yeah. language, that stuff matters. So learn, try and you know, be good at a couple things and advertise yourself with that. And you'd be amazed how well that pays off. So yeah. guys, let's thank Liz and Matt. You guys, just a few things. I want to put in a plug for our Vice Presidential Debate Watch Party tonight. It's going to start at 8 o'clock in the HFSC, and Scott is one of our great moderators. Oh, 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 and if you wouldn't mind, if you haven't signed in for the event, if you could just please do that here on your way out. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.